Welcome to the spirit world, answering your questions on angels, demons, and how the spiritual and physical worlds interact. And now your hosts, Debbie Giorgiani and Adam Bly. Well, hello there and welcome to the spirit world. I am Debbie Giorgiani with co-host religious demonologist Adam Bly and hopefully you. We are taking your calls today. This is just a special, special broadcast for the month of November because it's all saints and we remember all the holy souls in purgatory for the month of November. Very important practice for, of praying for the dead, and it's part of our Catholic spirituality, and it's an important uh, aspect of our faith. So folks, please... Uh, call in. You can call in or you can sit back and listen and learn, but uh, do uh, one or both uh, because we need your full participation here on the spirit world. We always be begin with the St. Michael prayer. I'll give the number after the St. Michael prayer. Adam will give a little mini teaching on all saints and the, the holy souls in purgatory, and then we'll get right to your calls. Adam, please, the St. Michael prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, here's the number, as promised, 877-757-9424. We're talking about uh, all the saints today, the communion of saints. We're talking about the um, holy souls in purgatory for the month of November. It's dedicated to the holy souls of purgatory, and uh, very important uh, how we can participate in helping them get to heaven. And very very, very important. So Adam's going to begin uh, with this. I like to call it like a mini teaching. I know some people said it's kind of like a, a micro teaching, but I know it's very clear, very concise, and that's important, Adam. But let me give the number again, because phone lines are already starting to light up. 877-757-9424. Just to let our listeners know of the spirit world, we have a full studio today. We've got our senior producer, Tim Mott. We've got our our main producer, Taylor Van Est. We've got David Magianis in the uh, house. We've got Adrian Fonseca as well. And we've got Carol Herrera and Libby Shortner answering calls. So we have got a packed studio waiting for you. So you can listen and learn or you can call in. Uh, but please make sure that you um, share some kind of comment or question about saints and the poor souls in purgatory. Adam, please begin. So, Deb, there's something really exciting going on right now for our listeners here in the United States and maybe those that are close to the border that could, could come over from Canada or Mexico if, if there's time. And that is there's a tour of the arm of St. Jude, the apostle, going on in the United States. A good friend of ours, Father Carlos Martins, is doing this tour. Uh, you can go to Apostle of the Impossible Dot com to see the schedule there to see if uh, there's an upcoming visit in your city where you could go uh, attend mass and um, you know basically ask for his intercession uh, it's a beautiful opportunity it's really really exciting I know in previous major uh, tours of, of major relics pr particularly Maria Goretti there was a lot of people that received a lot of graces uh, by attending these tours. So I just encourage you to check that out, apostleoftheimpossible.com. No spaces in there. Okay. Well, super exciting for me, Deb. Um, saints are a big deal in my life. Uh, they're a big deal in our ministry and exorcism. You know, we, we were just uh, yesterday praying and asking different saints intercession, and, and that was super helpful to people. So what do we mean when we say saint? First off, we need to step back a bit because a lot of us are assuming canonized saint, uh, somebody that the church has declared a saint, but it's actually broader than that. So saints are people that have a special place in the mystical body of Christ, whether they're alive or dead. 
okay? And the word holy, which is um, sometimes translated as saint when it refers to a person in Scripture, the word holy basically means set apart for God's purposes, right? Um, that's, that's the basis of what holy is. So when something is blessed, it's set apart as God's. So, for example, there are items that are used during the Mass, like the paten, the chalice. These items are holy and they're set aside for God's purposes. They're set aside for the Mass. They're not used for other things. Okay, and there's a certain holiness that comes with that uh, and the blessings for those items. People, likewise, that choose to cooperate with God and give their life over to God's purposes, um, they are used by God, for God, as much as they can, they give themselves over. These people are also saints in a particular way. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't sin, that they don't stumble, right? We know that saints are sinners. We know we are sinners. I, know, I can promise you that I'm a sinner. It's a process of conversion through your life. You're not, you're not born perfect. Uh, your youth is often fraught with, with temptation and falling. Likewise for the saints, and some of them were, were super... Um, um, you know, we think of the Confessions of St. Augustine. Some had tremendous temptations and, and sins going on, but God drew them out of that. Okay. But in a sense, all the baptized Christians are set aside for God by virtue of their baptism, right? So in theory, we all have that special role of being set aside for God via, via our baptism. So in that sense, we're all saints, all the baptized Christians. But in addition to that, we recognize certain people seem to have a more visible role that God allows that is meant to be noticed by the world, meant to be studied, and then celebrated for God's reasons. So there are a lot of people that are unsung heroes. You know, they're, they're saints through virtue of their baptism. They're cooperating with God and doing extraordinary things that God wishes them to do, but they're never noticed by the world or celebrated. And that's okay. Not everybody is meant to because that's not everybody's role. All of them point to the reality of God. If it's only in the lives of the people that know them and interact with them, but for the more famous saints, they also point to the reality of God for all of us. And we can think of different figures, right? Moses had a, a special role with God. King David did. John the Baptist. Mary did. Uh, many of our modern saints that, we, that we've that we heard their names and they inspire us. Padre Pio, Teresa of Lisieux, Mother Teresa. Okay. So these people are meant to point us to God. Now, uh, just to, to go back to, you know, a translation issue in many of Paul's letters, and you can look at basically uh, just about all of them, he refers to the Christian communities he's writing to as the holy ones, or it's sometimes translated saints, right? So we see a basis for this, um, the peop the living baptized Christians are considered saints or set aside for God, and we see that starting right in scripture. But also, Deb, of course, people that are have made it to heaven are saints, whether they're canonized or not, right? So they're in heaven. That's that's between them and God, whether the church formally canonizes them or not. The, the canonization doesn't move them to heaven. It's a recognition of the fact that they are in the beatific vision. So now to wrap up the basics of the saint, we, we could look at Catechism 962 for our Catholic listeners, and we see there a recognition that saints are both the living that are here doing their pilgrimage on earth, those being purified in purgatory that are they're kind of on the escalator, they're going to make it to heaven eventually, and those in heaven that are praying before us at the throne of God. Now, a final thing that is important, because we can kind of get to a place with this that is misguided, and that is the idea that once I'm baptized, I'm guaranteed to go to heaven. <clears throat> God doesn't take away our free will when we're baptized and set aside for God. We could still, in theory, reject God's graces and in the end re reject God to the end and end up damned. So being baptized doesn't guarantee that you cannot reject God. We still have our free will. We're still tempted in life. So hopefully we don't. And there's a lot of grace that comes through baptism, the other sacraments, etc., the prayers of others. But understand that it's not a guaranteed um, ticket to heaven. We do need to cooperate with God. We do need to make a choice. Okay. Another slightly controversial point real quick. Do people in heaven, the saints that are before the throne of God, pray for us? Or are they completely oblivious to us and not aware of us? 
there's two scriptural sources for those in heaven praying for us. One is in Revelation, and that's 5, 8, and 8, 3 specifically, and it describes the incense in the throne room of God before the throne of God as the prayers of the saints going up to God. And then also in Maccabees, and I know people are going to say, well, Maccabees was removed from the Bible, but be careful there. The Bible was first defined um, in the late 400s, and it wasn't until the 1500s at the Protestant Reformation that the Protestants took out the book of Maccabees. The Catholics never did. So for 1500 years, it was considered part of the canon of the Bible. And in there, there's two very clear references describing uh, particular dead people praying for the nation of Israel. Okay. Now, what will most of us think about, as we said at the beginning, is a canonized saint. So what does that mean? This is a person that is in heaven, that's between them and God, but the church has formally declared them, has formally recognized them. There's a few things that the church looks for that are required for this, for this formal recognition. And we're going to get into those, I think, on the other side of the break. And we're going to look at what makes a difference between a saint and a canonized saint. Mm -hmm. Okay. All righty. So you hear that music. Uh, please stay with us. You can call in at 877-757-9424 and ask your question about saints or the uh, holy souls in purgatory for this month of November. That's what we're talking about today on The Spirit World. But please uh, stay with us. We do have an open phone line for you. 877-757-9424. We'll be right back. Are you feeling lost in a sea of overwhelm? Hi, this is Coach Felicity with Stand Tall Today Coaching Minute. Many people find themselves challenged with overwhelm. Too many things to take care of, too many people to please, too much work to do. And in spite of their best efforts, they continue to fall behind with this overwhelm coming in like a flood. But that's not the abundant life that Jesus wants you to live. That's why Stand Tall Today has experienced professional coaches that will assist you in dialing down that overwhelm. They'll help you get a grasp on where you are and to create a plan that enables you to take bite-sized steps of action so you can live an abundant life. Why not take your first step right now? Go to StandTallToday.com and find a coach that is just right for you. Because life is simply too short to stay lost in a sea of overwhelm. This is Coach Felicity with your Stand Tall Today Coaching Minute. Atheists often argue they don't need to give reasons for their position because they simply lack a belief in God. The assumption being theists alone have the burden of proof. But is this rational? The answer is no, and here's the reason. Atheism can't simply be a lack of belief. Dogs lack belief in God, but that doesn't make dogs atheists. Atheism makes a claim about the world. Namely, God doesn't exist. As such, atheists, along with theists, must shoulder the burden of proof. Even if an atheist says he simply hasn't found any good evidence for God, he would still have to prove why the evidence theists give for God is not good evidence. No matter how an atheist looks at it, he can't sit the sidelines when it comes to defending his position on the question of God's existence. I'm Carlo Broussard with a ready reason for Catholic Answers, catholic.com. The Spirit World continues with Debbie Giorgiani and Adam Bly. If you have a question for the show, call 877 877- 757-9424 or email tsw at grnonline.com. 
We're talking about all saints and all the holy souls today on ta- on on the spirit world. Oops, I almost said take two on the spirit world today. And uh, we, w- we, w- we would appreciate your call, 877-757-9424. That's the number to dial in if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment about being uh, devoted to praying for the uh, holy souls in purgatory, which I am. Uh, that's been a new devotion that I acquired. Uh, a couple years ago, Adam, and we can talk more about that in the um, uh, plenary indulgence that is happening right now that uh, folks can still participate in up until November 8th. So lots of things we're talking about, but continue with uh, the saints, the idea of the canonized saint. Uh, so capital S ver- versus a small s, and we were talking about uh, the beatific vision. And so continue on. And then if you could move on to the holy souls, uh, because mm-hmm. we want to get to the phones as well. And if you'd like to jump in um, and ask a question or make a comment, Now is the time to do it, 877-757-9424. Okay, so the canonized saint, and by the way, we're going to get to where you, dear listeners, particularly you in the States, but anywhere in the world, can participate in this process yourself, and it's an exciting opportunity. So, why does the church canonize saints? And canonizing means give them public recognition and say, Um, They can be venerated and respected and studied in the universal church all over the world. So what's required there? Well, the person has to have a life of heroic virtue, and that doesn't mean that their whole life they were perfect, but it means that there was heroic virtue in a large portion of their life. And what does that tell us? That tells us that they're really participating with God's grace. This person is trying hard. They're participating with grace. They're doing things that average people just don't do because, um, boy, what is required for uh, living that heroic virtue? It's not easy. Now, so that's the first one. There has to be heroic virtue. They have to be worthy of imitation. And this is going to get to the core of, of why this idea of canonized saints exist. This is really the most important part is it's for us. It's to benefit us to be worthy of imitation, we think of heroes, right? Heroes in the secular sense, heroes in the world. We want to imitate those heroes, whether it's a sports hero that we have and we think, oh, if I could be like them, I want to be, you know, have that kind of achievement. It's in the spiritual realm that they're worthy of imitation. They're inspiring us to do better. That's critical for when the church considers somebody for sainthood. Now, or they can also have what is called the red crown, which is martyrdom giving their life for somebody else, like Maximilian Kolbe did in Auschwitz at the death camps. He he traded his life for somebody else that was in line to be killed. Uh, Or giving your life for the faith in terms of being a martyr that way. And we think of the Roman martyrs in the early church. This is another route to sainthood, which indicates just an amazing heroic virtue in the sense of giving your life for another. As Jesus said, you know, what greater what greater gift is there? Okay, so let's say there's somebody that seems to um, meet these these ideas, this kind of criteria. The local bishop has to start the process. Okay, we can't start the process. We could say to the local bishop, hey, here's this person that's passed on. They were really special. Please, you know, consider them for sainthood. Now, Five years have to pass from their death, at least, so that everything settles down and we we can think very clearly. We're less emotional. Five years have passed. That's required. The local bishop has to say, yep, uh, I agree to at least consider this. We're going to start studying this. Uh, When they agree to that, they let Rome know. And then a process of studying their entire life uh, goes on. And that's everything that they did that's recorded. Everything they said that is recorded. Everything that they've written is studied through their lifetime. And again, you don't have to be perfect your entire life. You have to see a development of conversion over the lifetime. If they're found to be heroically virtuous, or they gave their life for others, or for the for the faith, as we said, the Pope will declare them venerable. Now, in that process of leading up to that, during that study, they're, they're called a servant of God. So just by the bishop starting the process, they're considered a servant of God while they're studied. It doesn't really mean anything beyond the fact that they've impressed the bishop enough to consider them to be put forward. After the study, which is done in Rome, the Pope declares them to be venerable if he chooses to. 
then we start the process of looking for miracles and this is getting to where you can participate a miracle is required in order to prove that that person is in heaven if a miracle is found based on their intercession somebody asking them to pray for some situation they're then moved on to being called blessed now that miracle is usually a healing and we've talked about those on the show before there's a very high bar for that it's not just saying that somebody was healed okay it has to be instantaneous complete lasting and the medical doctors have to say there's no reason this should have happened this can't have happened medically okay it has to basically be miraculous something that mankind cannot account for then they're moved on to bless it and then the search for a second miracle starts and that second miracle is a further validation that they're in heaven interceding for us and that is at the point that the ch the Pope could declare them a saint in a formal statement of the church that cannot be rescinded it is a considered a final um, and solid um, not debatable statement okay it's a big big deal when the Pope declares somebody a saint so they really study these miracles closely now what the Pope is saying when somebody is declared a saint not only that they met those criteria but they are now a universal model for holiness and they are now recognized as an intercessor for the church and for us now here let's get to what you can do there's a saint um, sorry she's not a saint yet there's somebody up for sainthood in the United States Rhoda Wise in the Youngstown Diocese in Ohio in the United States Rhoda Wise her cause is being put forward she's being studied and if uh, if you want to ask for her intercession and if you do receive a healing miracle you can contact the Youngstown Ohio Diocese and let them know the details of that and to see if um, those can be used as part of her process of moving towards um, being declared blessed and then later to be there has to be a second miracle after the de declaration of blessed in order to be canonized okay again Deb but to close out on Saints the main point of this the main value of the Saints for us and why the church highlights certain people is the example of their holy life why because that holy life led to them getting into heaven and so if we think of a hero that made made it through made an achievement that we also want to make well let's look at the path they walked and maybe we can use that to walk a similar path we can use that as a metric to compare our, our life to and straighten our life out and say okay this person on this road made it mm -hmm. to heaven that helps mm -hmm. me and that really is what the church is doing in declaring saints right right okay uh, do you have more on the saints because I think I think we want to flip this um, agenda because we have a lot of folks waiting on mm -hmm. the lines for a long mm -hmm. time and they want to talk about the poor souls in purgatory yeah. so are you, are you I'm pretty clear on the on the saints and um, you know the road to full canonization and uh, proved by the church, the church and the investigation and everything. So if you want to hold on mm -hmm. the poor souls, and we'll talk about the plenary indulgence and more of Father Carlos Martin's um, relic tour of Saint Jude, uh, we'll talk more about that. But if if it's okay with you, let's go to the phones because we've got a couple that are waiting a long time and they want to they want to get on air with us. Sound sure. good? Yep. Okay, so if you want to jump in on the action here, uh, please call because Libby and Carol are waiting to pick up uh, the phone and uh, we can get you on air with us talking about all, all the saints and the poor souls in purgatory. 877-757-9424 is the number to call and uh, you can listen live. Um, we'll put you on hold uh, so you won't miss anything. So please call us. Let's go to Janice. Janice is in South Carolina. She's been waiting patiently on the EWTN app. Janice, welcome to the spirit world. Thank you. I'm happy to be talking to you this morning. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you've heard of the Flame of Love rosary that was given to Elizabeth Kindleman in communist Hungary by the Blessed Mother in Jesus in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I am Have you familiar. Heard? Yes, I am familiar with it. Um, but if you would like to share a little bit more, and Adam, would you like to comment? I I 
only know the minimal about it, Deb. I think you know more than I do. I, I've heard of the devotion, and I've heard mm -hmm. of people that include that as part of the rosary groups, but I, I'm interested right. to learn more. Especially for the month of November. So go ahead, Janice, tell, uh, tell us what you know about the devotion uh, and, and maybe the question that's associated with it. Okay. Well, in the month of November, for every Hail Mary you pray, you free a poor soul from purgatory. In uh, other months, it's every three Hail Marys you pray, you would free a soul from purgatory. And um, the Blessed Mother gave a petition to put in the middle of the Hail Mary, which basically is asking to spread Jesus' grace throughout all of humanity. And then Jesus gave her the unity prayer. And Father Blount, I don't know if you're familiar with mm -hmm. him, he has yes. really taken on the cause of the flame of love, mm -hmm. and he's an exorcist priest. And he says, when you pray that prayer, um, it, it's supposed to blind Satan. But as an exorcist priest, he has used it to f uh, free people from their demons. So it's a very powerful prayer. He says everybody should be praying it four times a day as, as a minimum. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there to everybody because I love this rosary and I love the fact that I'm blinding Satan in my life, and I love the fact that I'm freeing purg souls from purgatory. <laughs> So a uh, couple things, Janice, I just wanted to comment on because I, I have also um, spoken to a lot of other priests about this idea of, especially with the devotion of praying for the poor souls in purgatory. Um, far be it for me to ever disagree with anything Father Jim Blunt has to say. I think he's, an, he's a wonderful priest, um, and, and I know... Adam, you worked with him, I think, on a on a uh, specific event, and uh, given that he's an exorcist as well, I would. Uh, the only thing I would say is this, and this is just because I talked to many priests about this idea of freeing souls from purgatory. I think we should enter into the devotion with the idea that we are we are connected as the body of Christ. Okay, the church militant here, we've got the suffering souls in purgatory, we've got the church triumphant in heaven in the beatific vision. We are connected. Our prayers have merit. Our prayers are important. They do help each other and, and, and repair. I just get a little bit nervous about if we think that if we do something, it's automatically going to free someone. And I will, you hear the music. So Janice, you're, please, if you could stay put, you hear the music. Adam, I, I need you to comment on this because I talked to a couple priests about this and they said, be careful thinking every single time you pray something, it just automatically frees a soul. So I just wanted Adam to give, give him ample time to address this as well. You hear the music, you can dial in 877-757-9424. And we will be right back here on The Spirit World talking about all saints and the holy souls in purgatory. Have you heard about life coaching? Hi, this is Coach Felicity with your Stand Tall Today Coaching Minute. Coaching is one of the things Jesus did with his disciples. Whenever they were stuck, overwhelmed, or even struggling a bit, Jesus asked questions that brought clarity and hope. He then used ongoing conversations that helps them to navigate the path and completely change their lives. Just like the disciples, we too can find ourselves feeling stuck, overwhelmed, and struggling a bit. Maybe you need help in your marriage or with a parenting issue. You're navigating a loss, you want to improve your health, or advance your career. At StandTallToday.com, our experienced coaches will help you to take another look at life, renew your hope, get past those challenges, and step into living abundantly. You can find out more about coaching and schedule a free introductory call by visiting us at StandTallToday.com. Listen, life is too short to stay stuck. Contact us at StandTallToday.com. This is a Messy Family Minute with Mike and Alicia Hernan. How do you keep God in your mind once you're done with prayer and daily mass? It's different for each of us, but one tool we've learned to use in our family is Christian music. Whether you're working around the house or driving the car, it's far more uplifting to listen to than the overplayed secular love songs. And God can speak to you through it. 
It's amazing how transformative good Christian music can be. Music can help us memorize scripture and remind us of the providence of God throughout the day. It can teach kids the Bible in a way that they love. And kids can make music their own. As they grow up, encourage your children to pick out Christian music that they personally can relate to. There's all different genres, from chant to country to contemporary. St. Paul exhorts us, sing psalms, hymns, and inspired songs to God from your hearts. Music can help deepen your love for God and lift your spirit to Him throughout the day. Try it this season and see. To find more resources for your family, visit us at MessyFamilyMinute.org. The Spirit World continues with Debbie Giorgiani and Adam Bly. If you have a question for the show, call 877-757-9424 or email tsw at grnonline.com. Okay, we're speaking with Janice in South Carolina, and I just made a comment about the Flame of Love Rosary and the devotion uh, Adam, if you want to go ahead and comment on that. The only reason I say that is because I, like I said, recently I started to really take on the devotion of praying for the holy souls in purgatory. And many priests, uh, uh, some priests came forth and said, please, uh, I just want to caution you. It's You don't just pray to release and, and feel like you have that kind of... Um, power, if you will. It's really the, the effort of our prayers and we trust that God takes care of everything. So I just wanted you to comment on that, Adam, because I, I, they just made sure they gave me some good advice on that. Yeah. Deb. And Janice, thanks for bringing this to the show. So I did a quick search, you know, while, while I could during the break. Um, there's a couple things we have to be really careful of. And the first one is that, um, private devotions, particularly that come from locutions, um, they they would have to have been approved by the Universal Church and included in the church's list of plenary indulgences. I did a quick search. I'm not finding it so far as, as an official plenary indulgence in the Universal Church. I see that in general, the writings that came out of the Flame of Love movement were given an imprimatur. Now, that doesn't mean that it's binding universally and that it now applies to heaven, hell, and purgatory. The imprimatur simply means there was nothing heretical in the writings. It doesn't mean that it's in power now and it's enforced in the church. So at the local level, by the cardinal there, they gave it an imprimatur, meaning we didn't find a problem in terms of the theology of it. That doesn't right. mean that that promise is now binding on the souls in purgatory. That would require the the universal church, that would require Rome to include that in the plenary indulgences for the church. Now, so far, I could be wrong, but so far, I only had a few minutes there. Um, I'm not finding that having happened. The other thing I would say, Deb and, and Janice, that we want to be careful, you know, I'm not saying that I understand everything about how purgatory works, but I understand that it's a process of purification in order to resolve an attachment to sin. And so that is for the benefit of that soul in order to enter union with God, being completely perfected. And so it's not so much about you owe a certain uh, weight of prayer and then I'll let you in. It's more, think of it like therapy. You need to really get yourself completely straightened out and remove all attachment to sin. And that doesn't just happen in terms of you having an insight um, you know, instantly like that. God can do it through the Holy Spirit. I've seen the Holy Spirit do amazing things for, for living people. And there are plenary indulgences that we can gain. That's true. Um, but I agree with you, Deb. I think in general, we have to be careful assuming that it's very mechanistic and that necessarily simple. Um, so th those are my thoughts, Deb. What, what have you heard about this? Well, the... The one thing I would say is that my spiritual director said that he was very pleased uh, that I started to really devote uh, special prayer time to the um, holy souls in purgatory because they need our prayers. They and they will 
they will pay us back, if you will, because it's 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 part of that, how we're all connected as the body of Christ. So I love the fact, Janice, that you are very deep in this devotion and you are praying for those holy souls, especially because there are so many of those souls that people have just forgotten about. Um, they just, they just think, okay, they're dead, you know, let's move on with life. And, and that's not, that's not correct. It's not correct thinking. And so Janice, I just, so do you see where we're going with this just to kind of make sure it's in balance, uh, to make sure that we, oh, sure. we yeah. Yeah. What do you, what do you say about yeah, that, my, Janice? It, mm -hmm. Well, honestly, the, my focus in this, in the rosary the flame of love rosary is the unity prayer sure really right uh, right right because because of blind satan and um so but you know an additional part of it is the poor souls in purgatory so whether they're being freed or not you know it's not for me to say and um I'm, it's not going to stop me from praying praying the flame of love rosary and how about saint gertrude's prayer is that the same there where you're supposedly free free a thousand souls yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly how that came about. We actually did a show on that on Take Two with Jerry and Debbie, and we had a lot of priests um, call in, and uh, they, they, they commented in after the show and said, be very careful saying so many souls can be released. We don't, we don't know that to be uh, true in, in that way. And so, because like Adam was saying, it seems so mechanical, right? You know, we do this, then something happens. I, I think we just have to enter into the fact that our prayers have merit. And if we leave it at that and let God um, work it all out uh, and and do what he does best, that's probably the safest way, I think, Adam. Otherwise, it becomes almost robotic, wouldn't you say, Adam? Yeah, because, yeah, the relationship with God is is not mechanistic like that right it's a it's a living loving relationship that develops and grows over time and it continues to develop in purgatory and i would say before we move on i know we got to move on to other callers deb but one caution that i have and i'm noticing this more and more is there's a tendency in the public to maybe ascribe too much authority to exorcists in the sense that if some exorcist that they've seen out there says something um in terms of like a private revelation that that instantly is binding and authoritative. I'm not picking on Father Jim at all. I, I like him a lot. He's a friend um, or any other exorcist. But we do want to be careful of saying like, well, this is a special priest because he's an exorcist and therefore what he says goes. Um, we do need to kind of slow down on that and go back to what has been studied and validated and then promulgated by the church versus just because somebody's an exorcist. Being an exorcist is a hard job. It is a special job, but it doesn't mean that you then speak for God or, or, or speak for the church. Or know that a certain process or a certain prayer or a certain has, has the same results every single time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Janice, I hope that helps. See, we... We started this program for this for your exact call, actually, in, in the sense that we just wanted a solid, balanced catechesis so that we because we have a lot of people listening to the show that aren't Catholic and and they would like to learn as well. And they would like to grow in their devotion, uh, especially for the the uh, their loved ones that that have gone on. So so Janice, thank you for the call. We appreciate it so very much. We hope it, it helped today. Our response. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless. Okay. Thank you. We're going to move on to Christina. Christina is in Georgia on EWTN online. Hi, Christina. Welcome. Hey, how are you? You can hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, I had an experience with... Um, I guess, you know, like a personal revelation or personal, like when my father passed, um, I was 16. So, and I, I really didn't know that much about purgatory, but, um, uh, I had an incident where, um, it was actually the day of his funeral that evening, um, whether it was like in a dream state, but that he spoke to me. Um, and the thing that stands out, and I guess this is where my question would be. Um, anyways, everyone was mourning, and uh, I, again, I was young, 
he was not a very good man here on earth and um and i remember when he spoke to me it was like i knew who he was but it was not who he was here on earth um he was a very bitter angry man um he was an alcoholic but his voice or i i were not even a voice I, I mean his him speaking to me was like not of a suffering soul even though he pleaded for prayer um and that is what he asked of me um he said that um he was not in heaven and that it was beautiful but he was not there yet and he needed me to ask everyone to pray for him which is what i did the next day um but i guess my question is is the man i knew was an angry bitter man here on earth but it was like i knew who he was but it but it was just it emanated some type of um hope or something from him that i didn't know of from him but i knew it was him um is that possible that they they have experienced um that the presence of god when they have passed and their their judgment that um that they have to be in purgatory but they have this hope it's just it's something that i've i guess i expected just a you know like a suffering soul and see i've just returned to the catholic faith after being gone for a while um and have really been thinking about purgatory and praying for the souls and um I, I guess just a little clarity on it. Okay. So, Christina, that's a great question. And by the way, what you're describing is, uh, Deb, correct me if I'm wrong, is exactly the theology of the poor souls. So, um, and by the way, for all the ghost hunters out there, if, if something's manifesting, um, here's the deal. If it's a poor soul in purgatory, God may allow it to request prayer. That's it. No name, no when I died, how I died, my life, no secrets about the afterlife, none of that. They're only allowed to ask for prayer um, because anything else draws us into an improper relationship. So the things people are playing with in ghost hunting are not souls in purgatory, those are demons. Because why would God draw a person into further sin by allowing a poor soul in that kind of context to, to start manifesting? Okay, so Christina, yeah, that is right on. And anecdotally, from my experience of talking with people, um, and I, I had one experience with what I believe was my uncle, and from what I've heard anecdotally over the years, it's very common that when the poor soul appears, they don't appear looking like they did in their old age necessarily. They often, if they appear, it's kind of them as a, as a young adult for whatever reason, and they are more at peace. They are joyful in their hope. They have, in a sense, had a glimpse of God at their personal judgment, but because of their attachment to sin, they need that attachment of sin to be healed and their conversion to be completed because no sin or attachment to sin can exist with God. That's why purgatory is there. It's in charity because the, the soul that is still attached to sin cannot exist with God because mm -hmm. God is purely without sin. God is pure love. He is justice. Uh, and mercy, but he is primarily, in a sense, love. And sin is the opposite of that. So um, that that's my thoughts, Deb. What yeah, do you think? I, I agree completely. And Christina, some some things that you can do uh, right now to continue to help your, your dad, okay? It, uh, have masses said for your father, but attend the masses. Go to mass. It has even more, uh, it's even more effective if you go to mass. So go to mass. Um, uh, I think Janice will love this comment. Pray the rosary often for your father. Please do that. Um, remember, remember the souls in, in purgatory, because if your father has, has moved on and, and, and is in the beatific vision, those prayers, those masses will be applied, uh, to someone else. God never wastes anything. Okay. So, but continue, it's very important for you to continue. Also some fasting on your part, you know, it's, 
it's not just what we can do for them. It's also a chance for us to clean up our lives, whatever we need to do, right? So, because we're all connected in this. So it's kind of like this group effort. Think of it like that, Christina, but keep going. Don't just stop. And, and because it's very, very important to help your father uh, get to um, to the face of God, okay? Very good. Thank you so much. God bless you. Absolutely. So real quickly, Adam, because we're not going to get to it because we have full phone lines. A mm-hmm. um, couple things. The, the plenary indulgence that's still happening. Um, it have are The folks, please... This is a, a newer devotion for me. This I've always prayed for the poor souls in purgatory, but I'm I've I really did a deep dive um, a couple years back, and I'm I'm just completely um, hooked to praying for the souls in purgatory, especially for the souls that that have no one that can pray for them. And so, um, please go uh, look go online and look up the requirements for um, receiving that full indulgence. Uh, that is still happening till it started November 1st to November 8th. If you visit a cemetery and then the other requirements, because again, it's everything benefits. It benefits the the poor souls, but it benefits us. It, it, it goes around. Everything is connected with God. So always remember that. That's why when Janice was talking about father, Jim Blunt had talking about the power of the rosary, he's spot on. I mean, everything has um, a power and, and it, and it is effective especially when we are in a good place in our own souls and we are and we are working towards what God wants and I and I love that so it, I I just want to um, emphasize that Adam because I think sometimes we think prayer well what's prayer going to do prayer means a lot oh absolutely and and like Deb mentioned you need to check with your local diocese to see what your bishops um, per possible changes or tweaks to that indulgence so what the requirements are for you locally that's why we can't tell you for sure uh what the requirements are but you know being in a state of grace going to confession going to mass is almost always there in the cemetery Mm -hmm. and visit the cemetery pray for the poor souls um but yeah check in check in with your your local diocese's website see what the details are and there's partial indulgences all year long but this is a plenary indulgence a full indulgence for the temporal um, punishment. And it, it, that's important. I, and we can all use help, right? Uh, so Diane uh, is up next in Michigan on Sirius XM 130. Hi, Diane. Welcome to, to the spirit world. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I'm just wondering if anybody goes directly to heaven or if everybody's got to stop in purgatory. Um, you know, my husband passed away six months ago and he lived in the state of grace. He wore a scapula every day. He, you know, um, went to confession for Saturday, everything. He just emulated the Catholic faith. And I can't help but think that he went right to our Lord. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. Well, you know, Diane, we don't know because that's, uh, that's only for God to know. Certainly, in theory, it's possible if a person had no attachment to sin and perhaps they had attained a plenary indulgence right before passing. Mm -hmm. There's also the apostolic pardon that most priests give with the anointing of the sick. And if a person were unconscious, for instance, um, I think there's a chance that they would move straight to heaven after the apostolic pardon with no opportunity to reattach to sin because they weren't conscious to do so. So one can imagine a few ways it's certainly possible. but as Deb said, I would pray for him, not in a sense of feeling bad and, you know, thinking he's he's suffering, but pray for him in charity because it's not wasted, right? It, yeah, it will be applied absolutely. to others. And so to build that sense of charitable action, that helps us and it helps our own conversion too. Mm-hmm. So, so basically I'm saying don't worry about it, um, but pray for him and pray for the poor souls in general just because it's good for you. I completely agree. And Diane, I have a wonderful, I have a couple spiritual directors, but I have a wonderful spiritual director. He's an exorcist. And he says all the time, don't, don't ever assume that anyone has made it to the beatific vision. Always be praying for them. Pray for ourselves. We should pray for ourselves. The, the, the uh, church militant here, the church suffering and um, the church triumphant is, is helping us. So really keep that in mind of, of that we are all working towards uh, 
getting back to God and, and be, be of cheer and joy and hope. I mean, it sounds like your husband lived a beautiful life, a holy life, and that is wonderful. But those, those prayers that you have for him or those masses that you're going to have said for him, they're, they're never wasted, Diane. So it's all good, right? It's all good and it's all joy. What do you say? Okay. Yep. I, you know, I just can't help but think that he's, he's right there watching over us. And, um, but I do, I will keep praying and he's got a lot of masses lined up. So. Yeah. I did this. I did the same for my mom. I, I, I felt my mom went straight to heaven. That's how I felt, but I, I can't be, be uh, sure of that. And, and my mother has had round the clock masses nonstop. Everywhere I go, I, <laughs> I get another mass or I go to another mass for her. Um, but I'm happy and I'm at peace and I feel the same way because remember, you know, they will help us uh, always. So we're always connected in Christ, always, Diane. So your husband is alive now more than ever. And I'm sorry that, that he, he left uh, you six months ago, but I got to tell you, he's, he's alive and it's beautiful. And, and so we focus on that, right? We focus on the end goal. What do you say, Diane? Yeah. And I know he's happy. So that means a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Okay. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you, Diane. Okay, um, we're going to have to move quickly. I think, um, let me get uh, the signal from Taylor. How many minutes do we have left? Not many. Okay, we have four. We have four minutes. We can take another call. Let's go to Elizabeth. Elizabeth is in North Dakota on Sirius XM 130. Hi, Elizabeth. We tried to squeeze you in. Welcome. Why, thank you. So I have a question, and I'm not sure how to phrase it, but in the beginning you had talked about physical healings when we pray to someone who's a blessed for the miracle. And I'm wondering if it also, a miracle can be attributed to emotional or like someone who's left the faith and they return and they're whole. If that also, as they're doing the investigation of the intercession of someone for sainthood. Um, Elizabeth, probably not. And the reason is the church needs miracles that are like super clear and concrete in order to say that definitively happened and it cannot have happened any other way but that God did it. So if somebody comes back to the faith, there could be many social reasons, personal reasons, emotional reasons, and spiritual that led to them back to the faith, but the church wouldn't be able to look at that and say, absolutely, it was only spiritual. And that's what the church needs to do with these miracles for sainthood, which is why the healings are almost always the type of miracle they study because the outside doctors can scrutinize it and the church can get clarity that it was impossible but for God, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. I think it's always impossible but for God, you know, True. working mm-hmm. through us, mm-hmm. of course, but, and through the intercession of the blessed and the venerable. But, okay, thank you for your answer and your time. Sure thing, Elizabeth. Yeah, and you're right. Everything is grace, right, Deb? So mm-hmm. in the everything. end, everything is grace. Absolutely. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, we're going to ask yep. Carol and uh, Libby to uh, grab uh, Stephanie and Daphne and Patrick and Mary and the others, Lou and Elizabeth, all of their questions and comments. Could we make sure we get them? So we'll address them on the next mailbag show here on the Spirit World. Wow. Wow. We, didn't, we hardly even got to um, the poor souls in purgatory, although we talked about the devotion of praying for the souls in purgatory. So, so that was good. And the plenary indulgence that is still happening. And remember, the month of November is dedicated to the holy souls in purgatory. But all year long, we should always be remembering. So um, please, uh, just I think this is very important that we had this uh, show. I wish we could have gone... Uh, deeper into the topic of the souls in purgatory, but you guys had a lot of comments and a lot of questions and they were great. Adam, any final, final words on this topic? No, I'm, I'm actually very happy, Deb, because I think through the questions, we had a beautiful way to unpack, you know, the same material that if, if I were going to bore you and and just give you a lecture, I would do. So uh, (laughs) that Socratic method and by God's grace, uh, I'm very happy with, with what we were able to cover. 
Prayers are effective, folks. They're very, 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 very powerful. And that's why when when, uh, people say, well, what can I do? I can, you know, I can only say a Hail Mary. I can only say an Our Father. Adam, what do you say to that? Because you're in the exorcism ministry and you've, you've heard it directly from heaven. Oh, I mean, I've lived it, Deb. I've seen it. The rosary to me is the most powerful deliverance prayer that we have. And I've seen the direct impact, whether the person knows it or not, uh, the spiritual does. And I've I've gotten the direct feedback from the bad guys. Mm-hmm. The prayers hit them and they respond to it, whether that person knew you were praying or not. The other That's side right. does. So don't give up on your rosary. That's the best deliverance prayer. And uh, it's the it's place to go. Absolutely. Okay, we want to thank the show team. You guys did an amazing job today. And so for Adam Bly, I'm Debbie Giorgiani. Until next Saturday, have a beautiful and blessed week. We'll see you real soon.